Liam, do you want to say what you said before? <laughs> you just took a bite of food, so um, I can't, shall I rephrase what you said? I just finished. Um, okay. So that Kalyun goes over more examples of art from more styles than anybody else that we've read, except for, no, even, even oh, who was it? I think it was Rollo May. Um, where there were plenty of examples, but they were, though they were like varied and the ones that they mostly had like one subject matter, which was women. And in this, we have a lot more examples and a lot more styles that kind of help get, help gather evidence if you have to debate something that might be a gray area, unlike um, Kant or um, Hume or even Dewey where you'd have to have a debate if something didn't like clearly fit into one area or another. Okay, good. Uh, Jung doesn't tell me, tell you, well, that dream isn't really a dream or, <laughs> right? Or that dream really doesn't symbolize anything. I mean, every dream symbolizes something, right? Mm -hmm. and, and every aspect of life could be symbolic to you or could trigger, right? I mean, it's pretty comprehensive. And then the arts are trying to communicate with the psyche, right? Yeah. Um, all right, I mean, a big question would be, is there a difference between art and therapy, <laughs> uh, right? Um, but I think it would be that in therapy, you just are so wrapped up in yourself and your own crisis that you just have to express your crisis because it takes a step back to understand, oh, this isn't about me. This is an archetype. Like this is part of the human condition that I'm suffering in this way or it's part of patriarchy that I am, or it's the anima character, it's the anima archetype in me that I've inherited from my relation to my mother or something, right? That takes a step back. Um, and so I'd say therapy would be when you're so deeply engaged in the crisis. And art therapy just asks you to just express your crisis because you can't possibly begin to overcome the crisis unless you first express the crisis. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the other thing I would say about you, he really goes down and dirty, right? He really yeah. says, we got some really ugly stuff down there. And the Greeks, that's the most like the Greeks. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, I think I think this all calls back to <clears throat> art as an expression, obviously, but art is like a form of communication. Um, the new counselor on campus, or like the new school therapist, um, Victoria's specialty is in art therapy. And I haven't done any of that because I just sit in there ranting but it 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 the its connection to deeper self like you are having to go look inward which um along goes along with things that we've already read i think it's interesting to get a more modern kind of interpretation of that i figured that you'd recently been through something that if you could figure out how this fits right yeah, yeah. okay and actually, I know Victoria. I had her for a whole number of classes. And I recently found, I recently discovered her evaluations that I gave for when she was in my classes. And I'm going to give it to her when I see her. But yeah, she had me for at least three classes. Um, she had me for wit. I mean, you could say to her, hey, you remember that? And we did Carl Jung, you know. and she's going to go, oh, I remember, you know, whatever. Um, anyway, yeah, I knew she was heading for art therapy, and I'm so glad she's back. 
So what do I think? What do I think as a union or as a feminist union? That I think there's a lot of integrity she has by coming back. It integrates a whole lot of her ideas about the good life and her ability to do what matters to her. Um, I don't remember her having any crises of her own so much. She just wanted to use art as therapy for other people. She was more like that kind of a person. There's plenty of others that are using it first for themselves. Um, if so, she certainly didn't come across that way. But um, so then the other point is that there's two major turning points for people. And one of them is at your age, which is why I wanted to teach college. This is when you make that transition and you become a lot more aware of the unconscious, the way you grew up in a bubble. And it isn't just about, yeah, my parents were conservatives and now I'm hanging out with a bunch of liberals. I mean, that's very left-brained, right? Um, that's what Jung contrasts reason, like our reasoning capacity with this really deep stuff close to the brain cell, right? That, um, and if we tried to create a culture, the Enlightenment culture based on reason alone, he says, and that's just a huge problem. So did you understand that, that that's related to what we're doing in this class? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then he had, a, he had a beef with Freud because Freud thought that the purpose of civilization is to repress the id. And then the ego is constantly making deals. And Jung, and, and also Freud thought that religion is just infantile compensation. So when you uh, grow up, and this again would be college level type consciousness, you realize that your parents are not all knowing and not all powerful like you thought when you were a kid. And um, I remember I wanted my kids to think for themselves. I was not a, you can imagine, I was not a, my only rule was half an hour of TV. I was obsessed about not watching TV. Everything else they could do pretty much what they wanted. The reason was, I just thought they're not, they're going to grow up not knowing the difference between the sitcom and real life. And obviously that's a huge problem. Donald Trump, they still think he's, the guy on The Apprentice, they can't tell the difference. I mean, I didn't really want myself to be that accurate, but I do think. And because they didn't watch TV, they played with each other a lot. Or they got into sports or they did art or something because they always have to do something. I just really think TV is bad in terms of creating all these illusions uh, and this image of life that doesn't include all this really dark stuff and it will hit you and you won't know what hit you and you will project it onto anything and everybody else because it couldn't possibly be you because you're going to have that sitcom life. You're going to have that life in the burbs with the two kids and the two cars. And, you know, the more obsessed people get with wanting that life in the burbs, the more the dark side either, you know, erupts in them or gets projected onto the poor. And the more indifferent they become to people who are really suffering because all the problems are being ignored. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, really, should I, you know... I'm going to get that house in the burbs. And so I'm not going to, you know, people in the city, they're poor because they're lazy or they're violent. And I care about crime and I'm moving, you know, to the burbs because I don't want crime. But what about the crime of destroying the environment? What about the crime of ignoring your fellow human being? What about the, ultimately, it's going to come back to you, destruction, of the middle class and 
instability. You know, you don't think about that. You're just obsessed yeah. about this house and the burbs, you know. Um, I'm thinking of Minnesota. Minnesota is like that. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that makes sense to you that to ignore the dark side is just not going to make it go away. Yeah. Um, and that in college is when you start, you know, you should become more aware of that. You should have kind of a ability to disconnect with what you learned through habit, custom imitation. And then also, I don't know if you've thought about this, but what was it about your girlfriend that attracted you? And how is that related to your relation to your mother? That's what Jung would say, right? What sort of yeah. anima projection, right, was it? Um, for example, I can give myself as an example, was my parents, well, I figured out that my parents were the way they were because of their relation to their parents, right? That's Greek tragedy. And um, it's amazing how how blocked out, how much of reality you can block out to get your psychic needs met. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so my grandpa was the black sheep of the family, right? He had this older brother and it was this uh, Swedish Baptist church, which is a self-righteous, you know, it's very repressive of the id and very, you know, strict. It's it's not good stuff, not healthy psychologically. That's why I like religious humanism. Religious humanism is a celebration of life. Jesus says, I have come to have, that you have life and have it abundantly. And you're supposed to, you know. Uh, but anyway, so he had an older brother who sort of lorded it over him. And so he was the motorcycle guy. Like he was the black sheep of the family. Um, you didn't think your philosophy prof would say, you thought I was a blue blood, you know, my my relatives came over on the Mayflower or something. Nope. I'm the motorcycle guy's granddaughter. So, um, so he was the black sheep. Well, he, um, the, the Swedish Baptist church, typically married him off to this angel girl <laughs> right the perfect girl and she's gonna change him and everybody's you know totally happy well then after four years after two years she and my dad get no my dad's born two years later they both get diphtheria and his mom dies so my dad lives with his aunts and they feel so sorry for him and they love him. And he's, you know, he's, they, he has this sort of heavenly life because they're compensating for the fact that his mom died. They're doing everything to make him. And of course the kid that age, he doesn't remember his mom, you know, he's yeah. not grieving his mother or anything. So then at age six, my dad, my grandpa at age 35 gets a, 19 year old pregnant and they have a shotgun marriage and they all move in together with a six-year-old you know okay this is not going well i think this story is going to be too long so it doesn't matter it just matters that i had to figure all that stuff out before i could really know myself does that make yeah. sense to you liam yeah i think it does because are you having to go through some of that stuff? Like I projected my need. I thought, I thought my ex-husband was the person that I needed him to be. And it took. A yeah. Long. Yeah. There's, there's definitely some of that. And then there's, there's getting pressured into stuff and then like accepting what is, it's very complicated. And then there's, and then there's, um, especially for younger people, there's just the, Oh, well, that isn't too bad. So I'll just overlook it. Like, oh, this is this is a red flag, but there's also this, which is really nice. And it it it's really funky. But you know, you live and you learn. And I can 
I'll probably be assessing like the projections and stuff as I see Victoria more, just because I'm gonna be ranting and then I'll just have a realization and be like, oh, that's weird. Was that what you already were doing before you read Jung, or does Jung just give you a different take on what you're doing, or what? I, I think it's more a different take on what I was doing, just because I'd be like talking through things that would happen, and then it'd be like, oh, like this, that's this is a, like, oh, well, that's a form of emotional abuse, and I'd be like, oh, that's pretty bad, or. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, I'm trying to think of a specific example. But there, I think there was one situation where I would just project what I thought was happening and what I wanted, even if it wasn't there. And it was, it's not great, but it's also a learning experience. And luckily, philosophy is full of learning experiences you can apply to your life. Um, the way I you, teach it, it is. Yeah, and I think you brings a perspective on kind of what I was doing rather than anything like fully new to the table, but it does bring, you know, new stuff for aesthetic theory and also to build up. Did you think that while you were reading it or you just think about it now when I'm talking? About thinking about it more now. Okay. Than, yeah. yeah, that's why I think I wanted us to have a kind of a marathon about all of this. Um and then you can figure out, I mean, I don't know how many, it's just, there are very few people that we get to know really well, right? Yeah. Intimacy. Intimacy doesn't mean primarily sex. It means yeah. emotional, the ability to bond with another person at a deep level. This is very, very difficult. I am not sure I ever could actually. <laughs> Um, I thought I could. I thought I'm really easy to get along with. I'm willing to go the second. I mean, you know, like you. Yeah. Um, but then you realize other people aren't like that. <laughs> and and um, you get taken advantage of. I mean, there's just standard stuff. Like there are the leechers, <laughs> people who smell out somebody is going to be hyper responsible. And they sort of, you know, suck the blood out of them. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's just lots of trends like that that take a long time to figure out. But Freud, you know, oversimplified things, right? It's just the id and the super ego and the ego. And that's the kind of people will talk like that. But yeah. that's just a calculating left brain sort of thing, right? So again, yeah. Freud is still a child of the enlightenment in that way because he thinks the way our ego works and the way it's functioning in society is all this calculation, right? Okay, I don't want to study, but okay, I'll study two hours and then I'll give myself a hot fudge Sunday, right? Yeah. You, you make deals with yourself like that, don't you? Yeah. I'll go through this pain and then I'll give myself this pleasure and that's a functioning ego, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and, and then Freud eventually changed his mind and he said, beyond the pleasure principle, we could actually learn to take pleasure in helping each other out or something. But that, again, that doesn't get at what Jung is getting at, which is this deep-seated collective unconscious that we inherit. And yeah. it was the long product of evolution and what I have figured out in my mid-30s, for, for millennia, it's been patriarchal. And it's very unconscious that people absorb patriarchy in a way that they're just not aware of. And if you get stuck in the throes of it, it's really a problem. The same with racism, you know, it's so deeply embedded, it just is very hard to bring to consciousness. And when you do, you're fighting against so many other people's projections and unconscious assumptions, right? Yeah. I mean, you know other people are living in that prison <clears throat> that it took you so much work to get out of. Does that make sense? Yeah. And when you add 
constant advertising that keeps promoting happiness as this upper middle class life in the burbs, you're not going to be dealing with any of this stuff at all. So it's just going to emerge in these really unhealthy ways, right? Yeah. And the trouble with that is that trauma studies are big now, right? I don't know if you, I mean, there's, to me, I read a book on trauma and that's really good, but I somehow, you know, then you get on the YouTube and these people keep coming up. One of the reasons I think trauma studies is getting trendy is because parents tried to raise their kids with no obstacles. And sooner or later, like they have something like you where a relationship breaks down or they have some yeah. other reality, like they have no resilience. They were raised in La La Land. That was the ideal, which gives them no resilience, no ability to think, um, well, it's not as bad as if you're black or if you're poor or if this, right? Because my kids grew up around kids that were poor and black and, you know, had all these yeah. disadvantages. So when they hit the shit, it's the fan for them, which it does, they have some resilience, right? I mean, yeah. they get hurt, but they also don't think it's the end of the world and they don't think they deserve to feel sorry for themselves or they can yeah. sit in fetal position or they can go buy themselves a trip to France to feel better or some damn thing like that, right? Yeah. Okay, so that makes sense to you too? Yeah. Now, do you have other friends on campus that you think might have father figure problems, like their parents, especially their dad, is pushing them or competing against them, or they've got you know this father image in their head as a as a guy it would be an authority issue i don't know if you know anybody but does that make sense to you that there were yeah be? yeah okay yeah i can i can definitely think of people that have either been really pushed by their father whether it be like their dad actually encouraging them or just kind of like never living up to it um and then i i if i had to guess i, I would say I at least know one person who is just kind of trying to compete with their father um and it's really they've not turned out to be a very good person <laughs> um they just kind of like they're always striving for like the next impressive thing and they'll even lie about having done things just to kind of get that feedback and i think that definitely comes from like the their dad having done stuff and then being like i want to do stuff too um <clears throat> Well, Donald oh, yeah. Trump Jr., right? He's yeah. got a real chip on his shoulder, right? Yeah. He's, he's not as macho a guy. He's kind of small. And so he's got to yeah. have 100 guns in his house to prove. It's yeah. just, it's sad. The thing is, if one of those lawsuits ever gets his dad in trouble, his dad will throw him under the bus. I don't know. Yeah how he doesn't know that his dad is couldn't care less about him if push comes to shove because he's trying so desperately i mean it really is sick i think i mean i don't see a lot of it but i saw a few things and it's just like are you kidding everybody in the world would know that this kid has a chip he's trying to prove something and he never yeah. will anyway that's a classic that now the other thing I wanted to point out was when we talked about Hesiod remember okay so Gaia and Uranus she gave birth to Uranus well Uranus had these monster kids and he was threatened by them and embarrassed by them right yeah. and so that's the idea of the father he has a kid well, what if the kid is less handsome and less athletic and talented and less smart then he's embarrassed right yeah. but if the kid is smarter and you know cuter and better then he competes against them right so the kid doesn't have a chance does that make yeah. sense yeah anytime a parent 
wants their kid to be a chip off the old block, it's trouble, right? You should, yeah. your child is not an extension of your ego. And when people do that, they really cripple their kids. Like their kids cannot win and they definitely can't be themselves, right? And yeah. so the way I frame that is the Olympian deities are 12 different ways to be yourself. But the other mythological traditions have that too. And Jung doesn't talk about that. He talks about individuation, however, right? That you finally get this integration of the unconscious and the conscious. And you know who you are. Um, and his images of individuated people would be like the Buddha, right? Because yeah. he's got all this integrity. Or Jesus or... But again, people project onto these figures, right? Um, so imagine those um, fascist Christians. Like, what do they think Jesus was like, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like they don't think about Jesus. They think about in Jesus' name, this person is evil because they're, they had an affair. This person is evil because of this. These libs are evil, but they're not thinking about, well, what was Jesus like? He wouldn't be like that, right? Yeah. <clears throat> it's shadow projection. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you understand how the polarization, how a lot of that is what Jung would call shadow projection? Yeah. Um, I think I think the Christianity one is is both funny and also makes the most sense because there is a huge separation between um actually i'm gonna i'm gonna start that again so i'm gonna start by saying do you know the, the it's a show and a book american gods by neil gaiman so essentially gods it's a, like it's gods a are, book it's a book it, yeah it's it's a book and a tv show so it was a, it was originally a book and then it was adapted to tv and i think it got four seasons um and essentially like gods are real but the only ones that exist are ones that are believed in and what's what's important for this is that because everybody kind of believes in a slightly different jesus there are like dozens of different types of jesus out there like there's uh his a mexican jesus there's a spanish jesus there's a, an american jesus because when everybody prays to jesus they have like a different image in their head and that it doesn't really come up but there's definitely a separation between like what what probably a liberal's jesus would be and a conservative's jesus would be because a liberal is probably gonna be like oh yeah jesus was a socialist he told everybody to abandon their wealth and that you, the only way to get into heaven is to to be poor or that it would be difficult if you were rich um and like i think the kind of thinking about that the separation and the projection of one person onto what they would worship is interesting to see and hear. Um, and I think another thing that comes up is when you have a religious figure like Christ that can then be adopted into another religion as like, um, I think it's Hinduism where he, like Jesus is part of the Brahma because it, he right. is just another of the deities below what is the ultimate. And I think that it's funny to think of the projections and that that would be like heresy to the, to the Christians, but it really might not be. Yeah, he's think... on the path of the heart, right? Because it's yeah. about, and then Buddha is and Muhammad is too. <laughs> yeah. That wouldn't go over real well with the fundamentalists. Yeah. What's the name of the author of that book? Um, Neil Gaiman. I can't remember okay. if it's in I E L or in E. -L. That's all right. It'll come up. But, um, well, I mean, when I used to teach this stuff, I would say, how many of you think when people are talking their idea of God, it sounds a lot like them, <laughs> right? Yeah. There's some people think, you know, God is this authoritarian guy who's going to judge you at the end of, you know, and they're yeah. afraid God is an object of fear. Well, check out their dad or check out 
they're, you know, I mean, it has to do with them because Jesus said God is a God of love, right? I mean, you can't, which part of the Bible are you picking from? Why? What was your background yeah. like? Who, what your parents were like? What your preacher was like? And what you're like, right? And so yeah. I'd say, why don't you just cut the middleman or cut <laughs> cut out the God, just stick with, you know, human dynamics. Um, but that's what Freud said about children realize their parents, especially their dad, is not all knowing and all powerful. So they created this daddy in the sky, right? Yeah. Um, and I've had students who truly fit that. And it's funny because I put them into little small groups to discuss the material. And yeah. there would be a ki another kid in that group that thought, wow, this is exactly the way this kid thinks. But the kid themselves never say there's anything to question, right? It's just, yeah. well, I know that, that my daddy God loves me and I can pretty much do what I want. And once saved, always saved. And my God. What kind of daddy is that? And then I have other students who have to go through therapy because they're so guilt-ridden because their parents have just given them so much guilt in the name of God. And that takes a lot of therapy because anyway, yeah. I mean, but someone like Jung or the main religions, it's getting in touch with the universe. It's just keeping perspective which you can't be mentally healthy unless you stay in tune with the universe. I don't think any sort of, you know, Prozac solution. You can't just take a drug. You have to have relationships with people and you have to res have to respect the universe and nature, or you're never going to have psychic balance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and, and Jung doesn't talk a lot about that, that you need, but all those cosmic figures, those individuated figures were connected to the cosmos. Um, let's see. So he had the, I think I talked about this last time, right? The animus anima and the assimilation of the shadow. So these would be in the Greek view uh, Aphrodite and Aries. So originally there was the, the power of Eros and Thanatos. Eros is a creative urge and Thanatos is the destructive urge. And so that's what's getting um, Jung is talking about animus and anima. Anima, the female, it doesn't, and he, he says it's not women per se, it's in your body chemistry, right? Um, yeah. Women tend to have more, <laughs> especially if they've been through pregnancy, childbirth, mm -hmm. and nursing. Like their bodies just change. They have this huge rush of oxytocin, but that's a bonding, right? And men can learn that if they want to. And women yeah. can also be much more assertive, especially they get that way if someone hurts their babies, you know? So everybody needs both of those things and they need them balanced. And it gets associated with sexuality, um, partly because of the way patriarchy has emerged. And um, because in the days of the goddess, there wasn't, you know, the goddess is everywhere. There was not this cutting off of the physical from the spiritual, you know, they were integrated. You were nature. It wasn't. And you tried to understand how nature tries to heal you and you figure out the herbs and all this stuff, you know. There wasn't that gap. And then I don't know how many millions, but that's what I thought the Oracle of Delphi is the emergence of the rule of reason. So things are getting so sophisticated that we are going to have reason the powers of reasoning driving civilization and so the greek poets are trying to constantly warn you <laughs> this is going to give men an advantage 
It's going to put women who are home taking care of kids at a disadvantage. So here's all the things, you guys. Don't do this. Don't be tempted to do this. That's what I think all that stuff is about. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But I don't know anybody else who thinks that. And I don't think it's because I'm wrong. I think it's because people who go into the academy were very successful in the educational system. And the educational system worships reason. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's scientific method, social science, argumentation, rhetoric, all that left brain stuff that Jung says is dangerous if you, you know, it it represses your emotions and that is just fatal. And it came yeah. out, right? Okay. Um so the levels of the anima were Tarzan and Jane, right? That's just the pure lust and aggression level of sexuality, right? He's the aggressive. She's, uh, you know, that's maybe the standard Hollywood <laughs> cute, you know, the Hollywood folks that that get married and divorced. And clearly, I feel sorry for the Hollywood folks, actually, because people project so much stuff onto them and they're already good at acting and pretending they're somebody else. I don't think they ever figure out who they are. Right. Yeah. There are a few like Paul um, Newman. He was married to Joanne Woodward for decades and decades because they had figured out the difference between acting and living. Right. Yeah. And they Newman has this all these uh, salad dressings and stuff, and he donates the money. You know, he just does stuff where he's got his feet on the ground, right? Um, Emma Thompson was like that because her parents. You have people whose parents were also actors and actors, but they came home and said, you know, that's not life. Um, and they would never force their kids to go into it. A case of the really sick side of that was Judy Garland. Um, I don't know if you know. She was the... Um, what is that movie? The Wizard of Oz. She was Dorothy. She yeah, played yeah. that part when she was young. And she never... Everybody projected that onto her right yeah her whole career yeah did and she was really in bad shape yeah. the older she got she i saw her on some phil donahue show and i this was just my sister had the tv on when school ended and she was totally drunk and drugged out it was obvious yeah. but she had a daughter who had the same problem liza minnelli liza minnelli was in cabaret right yeah I I didn't know Liza Minnelli was was her daughter. Yes, and she was in cabaret, and she sort of flipped out in her adult life too. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, life is a cabaret. You know, she just lost it. She just didn't seem yeah. to be grounded in anything. Um, so you can understand how well. There's a whole lot of men out there. Well, Donald Trump, he's got a chip because his father actually made money. And Donald Trump was just a spoiled brat. It was given 240 million bucks and went bankrupt a couple of times. He's not. And he just tries desperately to sell himself, right? The Apprentice. I mean, that was a genius thing to do, given you are a loser, because yeah. he knows that people don't know. Well, I don't even think it's conscious anymore. He's just an inc a, a classic case, right? Of a disconnected yeah. person. And then the pe what people project into him is a symbol of their own psychic illness. Does that make sense? Yeah. They're compensating by thinking Trump is gonna be their hero. This is exactly what the kind of thing Jung talks about. Could you tell that? Um, yeah, knowing, having what you said, it, I, I see it. I don't think I would have drawn the conclusion without a lot more thought 
and like study of you just because I didn't connect it to like, what was I trying to say? I didn't connect it to people. I just kind of looked at it and kind of applied it to things that I see daily, which isn't, isn't so much Trump because sometimes I try and avoid him. No, it's good. But if, I mean, I, I raised kids under the poverty line. So I have a lot of empathy for working class people. It's really hard. And you, it's, it's hard to sleep at night because you're just, you're not safe. You want to protect. But nobody in Batesville would know that because now I'm playing this different role. But yeah. it, I mean, I watched the middle class collapse. So those days of the union, if you were a man, you provided for your family. Like that was proving you're a man and a hero. And then yeah. the system, and it's those damn corporate guys. It's just one set of white guys beaten up on another is what's underneath all of this other stuff. And treating them like idiots, you know, and punching their fantasies, which would be their anima, pleasure, fantasies, and phobias, which would be their fear, animus. And it's just very disconnected from their lives. And so they're failing according to their standard of heroism and responsibility. They yeah. can't keep up, but they, they don't blame the monopolists and the corporate folks. They admire success in business. Because I don't, I guess because that's the responsible thing to do. And if you take welfare, you're lazy bum, probably black, you know, I mean, it's just got, they've, the corporate guys, the advertisers, the professional Gallup poll, advertiser, business people know exactly how to punch the button. And from a union point, how to keep people disintegrated, how to how to keep them projecting their shadow onto somebody else, somebody else's fault. And yeah. there's that. There's what to be afraid of. And that's um, pr shadow projection. What is it that threatens you? What is it or who? So Jung lived through um, the Germans projecting all their crap onto the Jews, right? And the French, well, the French took revenge. And then the Germans, they're not going to be ground into the dirt. They're not going to be humiliated. I mean, God, the Germans would say, well, we have Bach and Beethoven. We have Hegel. We have Kant. Like, they just wounded pride. But I mean, they had something to be proud about, too, you know? Yeah. And um, so you drive people in the dirt, like the French blames the Germans for everything. And we're going to just pulverize you instead of balancing. And then the Germans blame the Jews because they don't want the Germans to think about maybe it was partly our fault. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, then. We end that, we start the Cold War. It's the same damn thing. It's the same shadow projection, right? Good and evil, black and white. And then after 9-11, oh, those terrorists, there's the good guys and the bad guys, right? And yeah. so for the rest of your life, you'll be able to, you should be able to like spot it, right? So that's yep. shadow projection. That's a failure to assimilate the shadow a failure to say that life is always complicated. Nobody's right or wrong. I mean, and there's so many examples in the Greek stuff. The thing I think of is that Agamemnon was such an SOB, you know? And yeah. yet at the end of the war in Troy, he goes and sacrifices to Athena and thanks her. And Odysseus doesn't. And he tells Odysseus, you get your butt back there and do that. And it was just, I mean, I think Odysseus had PTSD, right? He had lost his ability to have any emotional anything. And it was Agamemnon that got it right. And so that is the way life is. It is. I mean, I've been through some stuff, 
where, uh, where I thought something was clearly black and white and it wasn't. Um, and, you know, because I've been through a lot of this stuff, I could catch on. Um, but it's so hard because it's that one thing, that thing you're not going to give up. That is the problem, right? You can compromise yeah. all this other stuff, but you have this one. That is the thing that causes all these other problems. Um, and then the animus, the anima, is that so many people still fantasize about um, Ivanka and Jared, right? Like they're Barbie and Ken. I yeah. keep forgetting that because that wouldn't even occur to me. I look at Ivanka and think about what a... I don't like her, but it, based on what she's yeah. done and hasn't done, right? Not only that she started a shoe factory in Ethiopia because it's the place you can treat the workers like dirt more than any other place in the world, but yeah. people will buy her shoes and her purses because they have this fantasy. And so that's that's the disintegration of the anima, right? I mean, it's just so sad to see obese um on people who don't look good fantasizing right just they have to buy yeah. <clears throat> a purse because somehow it'll make them look better right it's the glamour thing but so where someone like Berger talks about glamour Jung just talks about the disintegration of the psyche and the projection does that make sense yeah I think Jung is is better, right? It's it's more true to life, and it tries to really get to the root, and then to figure out how to solve this. Whereas Berger doesn't have much of a solution, and the one solution is that capitalism, right? Get rid of capitalism, and yeah. well, that's doing exactly what Jung says, is that you're just trying to solve these problems simplistically. It's not just the economic system that's the cause. Yeah. The economic system will aggravate and make things worse, right? It will tap into your fantasies and your phobias to make money. But it's not the cause. The cause is simply our instinctual drives. It's our nature. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, all right, so... That was the, this, oh, remember the anima in Hesiod. We had that erotic creative force, but then when Uranus abused his power, right? So it's men abusing their power, that he's afraid of his giant children. Yeah. He's jealous and he's afraid. So then Kronos gives birth to Kronos, which again, is true of every generation. You raise your kids, but you know that they're going to have to face a more complex life, right? They're going to yeah. have to deal with technology. It's not just they're going to have to know more about computers, but everything is going to be more complex. And so you know that you don't know all the things they're going to face, but you can give them the basics, which is you know, animus, anima, assimilation of the shadow, you can model that, right? And try to get them in situations so that whatever it is they do confront, they won't, you know, they'll they'll avoid these horrible, uh, you know, coping mechanisms that just ruin everything. Yeah. Um, so Kronos is, is time. So Uranus and Gaia, the earth was just a rock, but then they started having offspring. They started, there were earthquakes, there were volcanoes, there were rivers. Well, then there's a natural history. There's a before and after, right? As the yep. earth evolves. So Kronos is born, right? So that's the next generation. And then Uranus is jealous of, well, um, yeah, then because Uranus is trying to control his kids, Gaia is pissed off and says, who's going to cut off his genitals? So it was this conflict between fathers and sons. It was the abuse of power. The son is not given a chance to become himself. 
that he that that eros turns into lust um he yeah. got lots of generals throat in the sea and then aphrodite so aphrodite as representing male lust that's totally detached from civilization and that undermines it does that make sense yeah does that make yeah. sense it's because I, I, yeah, given given what with the limited knowledge I have of Aphrodite, that does make a lot of sense. She came up out of the foam after Kronos cut off his dad's genitals. Um, yeah, but you know there is the image of Aphrodite. Really, what she should be is a vision carrier for other people, somebody that triggers their desire to produce, not just babies, but artworks or scientific theories or communities so it is you can look at aphrodite as the archetype but you can also the story of Hesiod is about lust aphrodite just represents lust it's a perversion yeah. of eros and it comes from the abuse of male power um and you know that should resonate a little bit when the kids go off on the weekend and drink and have sex, right? They're not integrated. And they don't even think it's wrong. There's anything wrong. It's like, they think this is normal. It's not normal, right? You should, you should come to college to try to know yourself. So drinking in moderation or something, but this aggression and this, you know, it's to me it's a sign of dissociation um but it's even expected in our country because we have a capitalist country capitalism feeds off of dissociation it it profits with every single shred of integrity that so it's punching every possible button to get you to fantasize about something outside yourself or fear something yeah. outside of yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so in a oligarchy, a capitalist oligarchy, people grow up thinking it's normal to be dissociated and they don't even check themselves on it, except you don't want to get in trouble with Title IX, right? It's external yeah. threats. It's not look, there's something wrong with the way you relate to people of the opposite sex, right? Just saying, oh, I was drunk. It's not, why were you drunk, right? Why are you yeah. testing this? Like, what is there about you? Are you having, are you rebelling against your parents because they were too repressive? Um, all of that stuff is related to this failure of our society to integrate the shadow and to balance the animus and anima. And I think we're in really bad shape with that stuff. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And then the art. So then you have all that art and you have art therapy, which is it has an important purpose but then you have people who go beyond that and can write these myths and stories that will resonate with other people at a deep level and then people can understand it isn't just me i'm not alone you know when you're going through a crisis you feel like you're all you're isolated maybe nobody's ever been through this it couldn't, other people couldn't have had it that bad. It's just horrible. And then you, if you, you know, read some of those stories, you realize, oh, oh, it's not like lots of people go through stuff like this. And I think my own experience was because I suffered what I did. And I always said, well, what if I were black? What if I were poor? What if I weren't naturally smart? What if I weren't motivated? What if I didn't have opportunity? What if my parents didn't support me? It's just like, my God, right? I have a lot of empathy. Um, and then I go, wow, you have so much more respect for people who have those disadvantages 
and have resilience or they're still on their feet, you know, like, oh my God. But my motto for that was show me someone who hasn't suffered unjustly by the time they're 40. And I will show you someone who does not know anything about the human condition. And they're going to be judgmental and they're going to be heartless and merciless. Why would you want to raise a kid who doesn't suffer unjustly ever? I mean, I can understand my mother, my motherly impulse, but you can step back from it and know, okay, just as long as you tell your kid you'll be there for them, you're not gonna, you're gonna be there for them. But it's not all bad that they got in a treated unjustly or got in an unjust situation it helps them with empathy does that make sense yeah yeah Yeah. and then once you understand that you understand adult life is just chipping away you know that expression chipping away well you are between a rock and a hard place and you're chipping away right trying to leave something behind that that's better than it was before and acknowledging that that is what adult life is and if you try to make yourself a big hero you know like i'm going to be a real hero i'm going to solve this or i'm going to really fix that you end up doing a lot more damage because you're going to run up against other people who want to be the hero or you're going to have to ignore problems and they're going to get worse. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so that that transition from youth to um, being independent and finding your own way in life and realizing you you're different from your parents. You might you know like them or not like them or, but then that's hard. That's not easy at all. Um, or sibling rivalry, another one of the households. The house of Atreus was plagued by sibling rivalry. So do you know do you know people your age who are just really have a chip about their brother or their sister? And it's kind of effect I mean, you know, it's affecting their personality. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say I'd I'd say I do because of the way people butt heads with their siblings and then speak about them after they butt heads. I think that kind of anger is, is always, it just distracts you, right? You can't find your own calling. If you're thinking about a sibling, you got to find out who am I? What really do I really care about? And you have to let go of all that other stuff. Yeah. When people are angry, they cannot grow, right? Yeah. It's a kind of a sim- a shadow problem. Anger is a shadow problem because I think Victoria probably told you this, but it's a secondary emotion. It's a way of dealing yeah. with fear, right? It's the sense of vulnerability. Did she tell you that or is that just standard counselor stuff? I think, I don't think I've heard, I don't know. I don't remember hearing that specifically, but I think I've been guided towards it. Again, most of my time with Victoria has been ranting. I think we're still in the listening stage. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, I, I went to Diane. Um, I had to get through a whole lot of stuff, though, before I could go to a counselor because yeah. for 10 years, I was literally in survival mode and I just had to survive. I went to one counselor and I was was obsessing about tenure. And she said, when are you going to get tenure? It's like, she knew she can't work with me until I am on my feet. I cannot fail because my kids are in college and I cannot. So I was pretty crazy, but then, (laughs) but that's another thing about college is that you don't have little mouths to feed. You're not, that desperate so there is space for you to be able to reflect colleges really should be about developing your reflective capacity 
and being aware that that's what you're doing and you'll carry that with you the rest of your life. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. So, um, so you, his therapist stuff is that you project, right? And um, the therapist has to be really careful about, on the one hand, the client, what do they call it? NL, Analyzand or something, um, has to be able to project onto you that you are the person you know they need to talk to otherwise but yeah. on the other hand you have to be able to help them come to know themselves and and that's why having a therapist sleep with a, a client or something is so perverse because there's so much trust and so much vulnerability there if you really want to go through the process right um you see little kids if you just once yeah. you raise a little kid it becomes very obvious if you're thoughtful about it how vulnerable they are how everything you do imprints itself on their mind yeah. and it will come back either as a kind of strength or as something that haunts them. And if they don't bring it into consciousness, they'll project it either onto other people or onto themselves. You know how so many um, kids, like they get beaten by their dads and they think it's their fault or their yeah. parents get divorced and they think it's their fault. That's... A lot of people in abusive situations do do blame themselves. It's Isn't that awful? Yeah. 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 It's such an abuse of power. And anyway, that's all of, that's what we're capable of, right? You you goes yeah. down and dirty. And um, but I don't know. That's where when we go back over all the other stuff, let's just try and see if we can skip a few and get to the chart. Um yeah. oh, the Jung and Closer, if you ever want to see that movie, that's something. Um, did you read the Son of Saul um, essay? I don't think I did, actually. Well, my main point of that was it's it's postmodern. So it talks about subjectivity and objectivity. And it's so verbose. And it so presupposes the blank slate and your subjectivity, blah, blah. It's really you know, about what Jung says, you know, projecting crap onto the Jews and all that crap. Yeah. It's it's really frightening to me, Liam, how the Enlightenment has written this stuff out of the conversation. They're just yeah. very few therapists like Jung. They hate Jung. They've been trained to hate Jung. And so if Jung is right, everything they do is stupid. They're not going to want to hear that, right? They're going to want to yeah. hear about how this kind of visual sensation makes people feel better during therapy. Or, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to know. But I do know that a lot of psychologists don't. They just, to me, it's trivial. Their idea of how to get yourself to feel better is just trivial. It doesn't go down deep. And because anyway, that's a modern, uh, the modern lie, I guess I would say. But anyway, so we're back here. Deep and powerful emotions, right? Okay. Yeah. So, but Collingwood isn't talking about what Jung is talking about right yeah because he just you know he just doesn't have a frame of reference and i think he thinks more like a modern person um authenticity burger he doesn't he has no interest in the collective unconscious and he did that sort of capitalism marxism thing right the economic system uh rembrandt 
painted his second wife without any ulterior motive, without intending to make money. Um, that that isn't the only, you know, obstacle to our brutality, right? Um, and then the Greeks and Jung, uh, Longinus had depth of mind and and a noble mind. Um, he doesn't explicitly talk about all this other dark stuff. I think he might be aware of it, but he does talk about the power of speeches, which is definitely true. Yeah. Um, Kumaraswami um, talks about the Atman, but not so much about the dark side of it. Does that make sense? Um, Hume then, these guys completely deny it. We're in the blank slate world now. Um, and Jung would, I mean, Jung would say the 20th century has proven that that was a big mistake, right? The Germans had all sorts of music to humanize emotions, right? The Weimar Republic was the great enlightenment. You know, they had science, they had Lutheranism, um, and they had um, a republic. And what happened? right and that's mm -hmm. where jung says actually catholicism is more insightful because it has the guardian angels it has the mary it has you know it has all that art that's trying to tap into the unconscious and the images and integrate it although conservative catholicism uses all that just to repress and so jung would say well that's an abuse of mm -hmm. images and I would add, they stole it all from the Greeks. They did steal all their artistic um, methods, right? They just yeah. took what the Greeks did and, and Christianized it, baptized it. Um, but anyway, Jung says that's more insightful. And then the Protestantism, especially like Calvinism, they're anti-art, right? And my God, you can't have any integration. That's Then you have all that shadow projection and all that. Well, a lot of the energy went into making money then, right? Instead of sex. Instead of sensuality, you repress that and go make money. It's the Protestant work ethic. But then the, how you make money is appealing to all this sensuality and making yeah. people conflicted. The more conflicted they are, the better consumers they are um anyway hume really didn't you know denied that it was as serious as it was kant also just they all emphasize science and social science then yeah. tolstoy had um christianity but again he was he was i mean he again went to communism if we just don't have private property and we have those basic Christian emotions, we'll be fine, right? He doesn't really talk about, he he talks about the darkness of the, the czars and their culture, but he doesn't, his idea of the solution, I think is too simplistic. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so that's what we have so far. And when we do Danto, oh, we did Hegel, sorry. Hegel also, explains darkness in terms of yes but history the geist is moving forward again he never thinks that no we could devolve in in a big way like with climate change we really could and never get back to where we whatever it is you want to call civilization at this point um i don't but he, hegel would never think that was possible Mm -hmm. um, and he also thought the Germans with their Lutheranism and their Republic and their science, that was the epitome of moving forward. So we've got a whole lot of, Jung really throws a wrench into the Enlightenment. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then you can figure out like where you stand in the midst of all this or where you think your country stands or given this decline in democracies all over the world. I was reading an essay on 
all the different well i was talking to indonesians about there was a chapter on what's going on in indonesia and there were like eight points and i said oh i told them all this stuff is going on in america also and america sort of started it but all of it has to do with shadow projection um fear right and yeah. you know just by observing trump or observing george w and you would know all of this and and nobody talks about the collective unconscious when they're trying to analyze what's going on um yeah okay so let's see i guess if there's um what well, you could read the um where am i the son of saul stuff or so do we okay sorry do we then we have does he you know account for the dark side that was something and i sort of in the past i've said that you know dewey just doesn't account for this but you know this time when i read it i just keep thinking uh how are we going to move forward you know um yeah. but you're gonna have to figure that out i'm at a different point in my life where i've been through a lot of darkness and um right now at my age, I don't have enough energy and I'm choosing just to move forward in every way I can before yeah. I'm dead, before I run out of energy. So I'm, I would, I was more inspired by Dewey than I've been for a while. But yeah. in your case, in, in the age, age matters a lot. Um, in your case, you're in that big transition in young adulthood, right? So that was a biggie for me. Middle age was a biggie for me. And now I'm in another phase. Yeah. Uh, again, the ancient traditions, the cycle of life is a big deal. People change according to their age. Their brains change. Everything changes and that's fine. But not if you have the human rights and equality and freedom and individuality. You don't account for any of that stuff. Yeah. And so you cope with it at best. But there's no way you're very good at it because you don't even think about it. Like, yeah. I know somebody, one of my students told me her neighbor, get the government out of my life. My kids are my property. I can do whatever I want with them. Liam. Yeah. <laughs> but there's well, an idiot. What? Yeah, there, it's, um, that's treating your kids as, as means not as ends property but there's an ideology right i have yeah. a right to life liberty health possessions um and it used to be that kids were property yeah. like their parents could do anything but my god you know i don't know it's just it boggles your mind how much harm you can do to a kid they're so vulnerable um anyway so so let's see we have that and oh here's yeah there's one more it's a chart in terms of the timing so for the enlightenment you had hume and then kant so first you had um and then kant and then i think the utilitarians were the 19th century um, then Hegel, and then Tolstoy. So they're they're kind of reacting to each other. Um, Kumarasawami, and then Jung comes along. So you can see this sort of gradual, completely selling out to the Enlightenment, complete belief, and that yeah. you know, the utilitarians in the 19th century it's, it's completely, everybody's buying in. And it was the first world war. Okay, Tolstoy, Russia, he's, you know, raising the red, red flag about the corruption of the upper class and the Marxist revolutions. So then you start having Marxist revolutions. Well, and then in the 20th, well, so in the 20th century then, okay, so the eight, 19th century was Marxist revolutions. 
but the 20th century was World War One, and that yep. was just a huge. <coughs> I know that Eleanor Roosevelt came to visit Europe, and they absolutely could not believe it. It's just because their ideology had been so enlightened that they just couldn't process it. You know this reversion yeah. to this incre incredibly primitive using high tech like ah yeah. the germans were the techies the germans were the musicians and the philosophers and it my god you know um and the french were supposedly equal rights and freedom and all that and they go take revenge i mean the darkness came out and um, so that's when Jung lived through all this stuff. He lived to um, 1961. So he lived through uh, what? World War I, World War II, the Cold War. Um, he died before the war on terrorism, you know, but it's just like he would say, oh, this again. Um, and then Dewey was a very similar time um Collingwood and then Berger is later and Danto so you could look at that and sort of think about what each one knew about what was going on what was popular in their day um the thing is for me I don't what I do is not what's popular it's not what's prominent and I'm convinced there were always classicists like me who were always trying to raise the red flag and who were ignored, <laughs> right? Um, because it wasn't trendy. We still have this illusion in the West that the latest theory is going to be the best theory because yeah. the person today has already read all that other stuff and learned whatever needed to be learned. But if it's new, it's better. And I just think that's such an illusion when it comes to the humanities. It's okay with science. It's okay with developing a new vaccine for a new variant of COVID, but it's terrible for the humanities. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Some new theory of, well, process philosophy. It's got this whole language. It's a jargon. It's like you aren't going to live it if you can't speak the language. Are you kidding? Um, it's bad. Um, anyway, so the son of Saul is about during the uh, Holocaust and the way she interprets it. I would just, you know, if you want to think about the difference between the way Jung would interpret it and the way she interprets it and the way she brings yeah. in all this postmodern stuff, it just drives me nuts. And then closer, if you ever want to watch that movie, um, this one guy is, the doctor is a Zeus guy. He's also a pedophile. Um, and then there's the Persephone woman is clear and the Apollo guy is clear. And then the Julia Roberts character is kind of stuck in the middle of all of them, which are she, she actually, no, no, she is superficial. And then the somebody wakes her up and gets her to realize what's been going on around her. So it's very dark. It's really, you come away with a pretty ugly feeling, but it's true to life, right? There's no cosmetics. There's no covering anything up. Um, he also did the, the Graduate. I don't know if you know the movie, The Graduate. Do you I've know? I've heard of it. Okay, it was a big, it, it was a big '60s thing. The thing that bothers me is that every seven years there's a movie about how upper middle class suburban life is not really all that hot, and you shouldn't really fantasize about it, you know. And yeah. you have a story of this guy whose wife has the ideal life, but she's totally frustrated and she wants to have an affair with this college kid. Um, and he ends up falling in love with her daughter, <laughs> yeah. which, you know, it's, just, it's it's not an original kind of story, but it's about, it was big because it's like, oh yeah, you know, maybe I shouldn't fantasize about this upper, 
middle upper middle class life in the burbs but you know everybody goes back and does it anyway another seven years comes there was one called ordinary people there was one called american beauty <laughs> you know they yeah, just american, every seven american years beauty or so you know you know american beauty yeah especially because of the the rose scene that's parodied in thing after thing but I mean, it's the same story, right? Yeah. But yeah. like, then the advertisers come and the Gallup poll come and it's all forgotten and Hollywood take does its thing once again and the movie stars and whatever. And then there's some movie and it makes a ton of money too, incidentally. You know? <laughs> they make a whole lot of money on getting you to forget and remember. I don't know people are still fantasizing about the good life in a way that's just so corporate. Um, I don't know. Life goes on. Um, all right. So you're done listening to me talk, Liam. Um, I mean, if there's still more to go over, I've got time and I can, I'm still listening. I think I'm absorbing information. Well, I know I have, I'll spin through this really quickly, though, because um, what is art? Oh, do you remember? Well, actually, I didn't talk about modern art is an expression of this split, split consciousness. Do you remember yeah. that? He talks about that. Yeah. So if modern art is this cry for help and this, um, you know, image that we have a split consciousness and we're really a sick society. That's great. Yeah. But is that what people get out of it when they look at it? I don't know. Um, yeah, good question. I'm not sure. Yeah. So I know there's a sculpture garden in Minneapolis and it has some sculptures that I think are about that. But it's hard to know if that's what people get out of it, you know? Yeah. Um, anyway, I liked his interpretation of stuff and I his choice, he chose certain things. Um, but when there was the artist who had found objects, right? He just picked yeah. stuff up and he's looking for the soul of the object. Now, that's fine, but if if capitalism does its thing and convinces people that oh morals are relative you know i want to go pick up a shell off the sea that's fine anybody can do anything they want and i can find an object and call it art right if it means completely trivializing art and life then they miss the point does that make sense yeah okay and that's where an art critic like Jung could really raise the red flag, right? This is yeah. not, this is, it's seriously, that's a serious mistake because it means you're not going to do what the artist wants you to do with your sight. You're not going to heal this horrible wound. Um, yeah. So finding, finding the soul of a found object is trying to, um, make nature sacred again after we have desecrated her and impersonalized her and abused her and manipulated her you know finding an object and trying to find the soul of natural things is really important for healing this awful wound does that make sense yeah okay um all right. The wounded uncon the wounded consciousness of modern man is what it's about. And I, I totally agree with that. I guess because I'm in a profession. Okay, so Liam, if you go into philosophy, you're going to find a lot of people who are just attack uh, dogs with their brain, right? Yeah. And they are out of touch with their unconscious. They're emotionally immature like they have to prove themselves with how smart they are and they just yeah. use that as their tool to legitimize themselves and to think of themselves as superior i guess i mean god i've been to too many graduate seminars too many paper readings it's just 
I thought philosophy was about being profound. And what I find is what you get rewarded for is sitting there staring at your navel, making intellectual dis uh, distinctions. And sometimes people go very interesting, but, and it's all very proper. And some of them just go attacking, right? But yeah. either way, it's all this hyper intellectualism. And I wonder when I listen to these people have families, do they, you know, do they have kids? Do they live alone? What are their friends like? And then did they ever volunteer if they have kids? Did they ever volunteer for the PTA? Do they ever connect with people? And what I really worry about is they do have kids and then they, because they're not participating in public life, they become afraid of crime and their kids aren't gonna get the education they want. And they develop this shadow, right? And they don't want to admit part of it is because you're totally disengaged and you have so much you could offer and you offer nothing. And so the society gets worse and worse. And now, oh, I got to protect my little baby. I'm going to vote for Trump or some, you know, they become conservative. And they're supposed to be people at the cutting edge questioning the society and the way it's structured. But if they get disengaged from public life, they're going to become conservative in a really bad yeah. way, reactionary. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, one thing that happened in grad school was that the white men started blaming affirmative action. You know, I know I could get a job, but, you know, the women are getting the jobs. The blacks are getting the jobs. And it's just like, do you know anything about affirmative action? Do you know how it works? Um, yeah. it was shadow projection, right? It You finally hit their insecurity button. And as soon as you hit their button, boy, they'll just be as polarizing as, as anybody that they criticize. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, they'll criticize someone's religious belief in a, you know, instantly without realizing that, well, there's different kinds of, of beliefs and but if somebody hits their button boy everything's black and white all of a sudden anyway so um then there's pollock have you ever seen a pollock painting i've seen yeah i've seen a couple jackson pollock paintings you stand in front of them right they're huge yeah well what's your reaction to them um I'm gonna have to look one up. I know, I know they're a bit chaotic. I'm sorry, I'm trying to look up the specific one. It's like splatter art for a lot of them. And it's tough to tell. Um, yeah, that, that's the one I was thinking of. And I don't know who did. Yeah, no, the ones I thought of were a lot less all over the place. Like they had less paint on them and it was more like splatter art but this what what seems to be his more popular stuff is just it's what i imagine night terrors are like yeah like when you're trying to think back on them. right so that's what jung would say it's a expression of the collective unconscious that it's gotten completely oblit completely yeah. blown blown up like you dropped a nuclear weapon in the collective unconscious and it's it's dangerous right it's completely unmoored, right? So you went from this puritanical repressive to this complete, you know. Um, now, the thing about Pollock, if I saw a movie or I, about his life, is that it's one thing to be calling out, hey, we're not creating a civilization, you know? We're deluding yeah. ourselves. But it's another thing where he really is just affirming this. He yeah. he he completely abused women. And I mean, it's just like Andy Warhol. Originally, he might have said, hey, our society is just a bunch of commercials. It's terrible. And Marilyn Monroe, Fang, you know, there's something other underneath. I don't think you should blame her. But it's, you know, she's not the 
naughty one. It's the men who project all their crap onto her. But anyway, but yeah. then he literally became a brand, right? He bought his own product and he became degenerate. Um, so I think Pollock bought his own schlick and it wasn't critical anymore. And it's like, it if Western culture has dropped a bomb into the collective unconscious by denying that it ever existed and repressing and repressing, which that's what I think, right? Hume, yeah. Kant, all these people denied that there is this primitive drives that are not going to go away. Um, yeah. Right? So that is an important message that what's happened is they've just, they're all over the place and they're very dangerous and they're just like that. Um, that's fine as long as you know that we have this huge project to try and weave it back together. And yeah. so the Celtic art is about weaving um, and it it is symbolic of the unconscious, but it comes from, you know, religion. Um, here's an example, stuff like that. All that weaving. Um, Athena was a weaver. She was the goddess of justice and wisdom. But she, when she went home to take a break, she wove cloth. And she weaves yeah. people together. And she weaves cloth to provide for their physical well-being. Yeah, the whole Greek thing. There's a physical thing. Anyway, so, um, so Warhol turned into his own brand. And... Um, yeah. Nietzsche, I think he's ironic, but he, when people read Nietzsche, they just become these big teenage rebellion, re rebels. There's a lot of people in philosophy like that. They just want to blow everything up. That just yes. means that, I mean, Jung would say that's after denying the collective unconscious, trying to create this fake civilization, and then rebelling against that fake civilization but rebelling against it with a completely unassimilated shadow just yeah okay okay and so um the the idea that because you're denying this personal god who's who's going to you know the daddy in the sky who will reward you or punish me i mean you kill that off and you have an inner void that's completely false dichotomy right yeah so if you compare for example a jackson pollock i remember i was in an art museum my mother is an art historian all right yes. she likes everything she's very generous but she also was formed in a way that she was very stable right i mean she had yeah. her parents but there was no violence in her family there was no she had an aunt that really was her guiding light. So I stand in front of that Pollock painting and I just go berserk because like, I feel this, I know this. Uh, yeah. And this is the struggle is to get over this. This is, I understand this. And my mother, and I'm saying, I can't, I got to get away from, my mother's going, oh, Martha, he's got something to say. You know, you have to be fair. <laughs> she can say that because she, it isn't her generation. Like she doesn't understand this. Yeah. Um, but I, that's, that's how I think about stuff. I mean, art is powerful, but you really, I really think it's important to know you know, uh, an art critic could say Pollock bought his own schlick, you know, like he was yeah. sensitive, but he went and bought into his own thing and Warhol did. And um, anyway, that an art critic needs to call that out. Um, Nietzsche might have started out. He's got this bone in his, got this bee in his bonnet about the Hegelians. But he blames Socrates. He completely misrepresents Socrates and he plays the role of Alcibiades. And it's just, anyway. Um, but to go from getting rid of this daddy in the sky, which is basically getting rid of your own father, to this complete rebelliousness, that's an, that's an anim, uh, shadow problem. And it's a problem men have, <laughs> right? Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> women have it. Athena defended the patriarchy. There's so many women in Republican politics now that are just such defenders of really awful patriarchal stuff. Have, I mean, does this, do you understand this? Do you, Lauren Boebert and uh, Marjorie yeah. Taylor Greene, right? It's just, they're yeah. the worst of the worst. It's like they're fighting for approval and they'll even go farther than a lot of guys will go. Um, that was called the queen bee. I ran into a dean, a woman who picked on women more than she, I mean, she just had a bee about women especially yeah. if they had kids and they weren't playing the, the guy's game. So that's that's what they are. They're like, they sold out Athena's. Um, and there should be artists calling this out, right? There should be women artists calling this out, but yeah. okay. Um, anyway, I, I thought that the dying myth, the myth of the individual victorious hero, that makes sense that we've got to stop getting over that. I mean, we've got to get over that. Does that make sense, Liam? Yeah. Um, and you have to balance. But the thing is, that's what the story of the Iliad was about. Achilles, get over your hero complex, you know? And Agamemnon, get over your power complex. It's not as if this hasn't happened before, but okay, we keep forgetting it and having to go back. Um, self-knowledge is so important and you aren't going to have a just society and you aren't going to have ethics and you're not going to have anything because those aren't separate ideologies and so you can compare this to what you study in business and professional ethics i think that's really interesting because it doesn't it would never bring up anything like this right yeah yeah okay good well i'm glad you're taking you know that's why it's nice to have a whole philosophy program because you get this whole big picture of how this stuff does or doesn't come together. Art and yeah. religion, it depends upon religion. Uh, Protestantism is very different from ancient tribal societies. Art and philosophy, um, art and education, art and manip it's all really about self-knowledge, knowing you know, your capacity for good and evil. Yeah. Um, four functions, thought, feeling. Okay, so sensation we take in, then we have emotional reactions, then we reflect on them. But intuition is where, you know, you can, you can come up with an idea of the good with an um, integrated response to what's around you that's not out of balance. Um, but because it's so easy to get out of balance, there's always plenty of work for artists to do. And there's also plenty of different kinds of art that would be perfectly legit because they're speaking to different, um, well, some of them are speaking to psychic illnesses. Some of them are creating a vision, right? Yeah. The individuated person would create something with a vision so it's a positive thing it's a creative thing it's trying to inspire you to move in this direction but it's not denying the dark side so maybe the best artists probably do some of both you know what i mean yeah they don't get in a rut they try to feel out the spirit of the times their own things and then where to go from here some combination of all that um <clears throat> anyway that's enough any comments by you i i think i i think aesthetic theory is this is kind of a kind of a sidebar i think aesthetic theory is really helpful in understanding the actual like thought processes processes behind certain philosophers like I don't think I would have picked up Kant in ethics nearly as easily without understanding like his views on art. Um, so I, I definitely, I definitely agree with having a full philosophy program and a broader understanding of different philosophers can help in understanding the aspects of all of their works, which is really helpful. So it's just a little side note that I got really lucky because we covered Kant at a similar time in both classes. 
and I didn't, I wouldn't have picked them up as easily otherwise. Well, I like the arts because they educate your imagination, right? And yeah. then because all of our reasoning occurs within some kind of context, either both around us and within us, you know, yeah. arguments are not in a vacuum. Um, but, and also I, the way I do philosophy is very synthetic. So yeah. really, honestly, most philosophy departments in big colleges have five members and eight factions. I mean, they don't agree with each other and yeah. you can't sort of have them both. They set students up to have to choose. And because they're trained that way and they keep writing in the same vein they're trained in, they ramrod this view up the kazoo because that's what they get rewarded for mm -hmm. so yeah when you go to grad school you just remember the experience you got is so generous generous right yeah it's not going to be like that um and my professor warned me of that too um but he he just got really mad at me if i faltered you know because he didn't want me to quit um yeah. But it's up to you. It's just that you would have a real mission, right? Because you would know that other philosophy teachers aren't going to do what you're having done to you. <laughs> what Dr. Beck is doing. I mean, you know, I don't, I just throw stuff out at you. And I throw a lot of stuff at students and they, they have to process it. Now, Damon, for example, would react very differently to every lecture I would give, right? Yeah. Um, so he's a different person. And you're then you, right? Yeah. And so, you know, it is what it is. And um, that you just can't tell people if you really want to have a free mind. And then you have to just hope that people will realize the limits they have to make impose on themselves to have a democracy that's what you really okay just don't vote for anti-democratic people you know so yeah. yesterday was a little hopeful but i don't know why it's close i don't understand why it's close yeah uh, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of game in politics it's weird yeah i just anyway it's not as bad as they thought it would be and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um.